into, into Gary's uh, introduction. So as you all know, uh, Gary is a wonderful painter and he's also a professor of painting and drawing at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, Chapman has had over 80 solo exhibitions with institutions such as the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, the Art Center of St. Petersburg, Florida, University of Cincinnati, University of Georgia, and the Indianapolis Art Center. He has also participated in numerous group and invitational exhibitions with regional, national, and international venues. Chapman was awarded and named a Joan Mitchell Call Legacy Artist in 2013 and has received numerous grants and fellowships, including the 1996 National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship and Painting from the Southern Arts Federation and a 2002 and a 1994 Individual Artist Fellowship from the Alabama State Council of the Arts. You are busy. You've been very busy. <laughs> um, his work has been reviewed extensively and is published in over 20 catalogs and books, including the four editions of New American Paintings. 13 paintings by Chapman have been purchased for collections of 10 different museums and in the Southeast region, as well as by many other corporate and private collections throughout the country. Currently, Gary's glorious painting, Man with a Stick, is on view in WMA's main gallery until the end of the month. Um, so please, if you're if you're in the area and you have time to stop by the museum, please check it out. Um, if not, you can see it online. It's much better in person. Um, but anyway, with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to you, Gary. Um, thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to scoot on out of here. Excellent. Thank you, Holly. And uh, I can't see anybody out there, but I assume there are a few people. So <laughs> uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm just going to get right into my uh, presentation. And um, Holly or somebody, could you um, confirm that you can see my, my title screen? Yes, we can see it. Awesome. Okay, here we go. So uh, my lecture is about my paintings and drawings and um, the general title is Thoughts on Realism. I have um, um, often been called a realist painter and sometimes a figurative painter, and I've never really been terribly comfortable with either of those titles. A lot of baggage comes along with uh, being known as a figurative painter, and I'm not even sure what realism means. And so um, I like to ask my students, you know, wh what does it mean to be a realist and or what is realism? And for that matter, it, it's a pretty sticky situation to um, even begin to define what is real. When I'm lecturing about painting to my students, I, I will show them these examples. It's clear that uh, one on the left falls into the category of what we think of as realism and the one on the right is abstraction. However, I like to flip that and suggest that actually the painting on the left is incredibly abstract. Uh, the notion that you can recreate an A1 sauce bottle and a ketchup bottle on a flat screen, on a flat canvas, is really kind of um, uh, unreal. And yet the painting on the, on the right uh, is nothing more than what it proclaims to be. It is red paint on the canvas. Uh, it is exactly real. Actually, neither are real because uh, you're looking at a screen and you're looking at uh, electronics and light. And so in some ways I may have um, duped you. Uh, so the larger title for my lecture would be an artist journey, the search for meaning and truth and what is real. I apologize for the sirens going on. <laughs> I live right in the middle of the city. They'll be gone in just a second. So I was studying um, painting in the um, late 70s, early 80s. And what drew me to painting was I was enamored by the great classical painters, uh, Caravaggio in particular. At the same time, I was studying at a university. And so I was intrigued by uh, concepts of abstraction and Wassily Kandinsky, the uh, father of abstraction. The problem was when I looked for contemporary um, um, examples of those two movements, I kind of felt like the art world had gone bankrupt. Chuck Close had reduced 
uh, painting to this sort of mindless duplication of a photograph. And Morris Lewis uh, was sort of mindlessly dripping paint on the canvas. You might think that that would be upsetting for an artist, but I found it incredibly liberating. I was studying in grad school in the, in the mid eighties and music became really important to me uh, as I started to define myself as an artist, very provocative music that uh, sort of filled my head with ideas and images. One of the first paintings I did after grad school was this painting, One of Two Sons. And in my mind, I was trying to fuse ideas of abstraction and realism. So that if you block off the right-hand panel, uh, you're just left with color and light and not maybe not even a horizon line. And if you block off the left panel, it's sort of an academic uh, figure study. But it's the combination of these two things with synergism that something greater is happening. Two plus two is equal to five. I went off to Interlochen to teach for the summer, uh, having graduated from Cranbrook, and I knew that I, I could talk about abstraction, but my hand knew nothing of it. So I launched into a series of charcoal drawings that summer. I did a hundred of these while I was teaching uh, during the day uh, at Interlochen Arts in Northern Michigan. And uh, the idea was that I, I would learn something about it. My hand would learn about mark making and abstraction, and I would later bring this back to my painting. So the first step uh, moving back or, or back to painting was just to simply go larger. These are actually large drawings. The next step was to uh, go to the canvas. Um, and I decided to stick with black and white because um, I, I felt like I couldn't just jump right back into full color painting. So I went, I went to black and white and I started incorporating wax into the medium to keep me from per perfecting or, or uh, polishing everything up. You can see there's a lot of texture in this piece, uh, Icarus building his wings. And so some of the paint there gets about an inch thick. I was sort of lathering it on with a palette knife and just playing with this sort of notion of 20th century uh, chiaroscuro. Uh, it was a very experimental time for me. I was in Baltimore and um, I was finding all this junk outside of my studio in Fells Point and I just started montaging and collaging things. Um, and um, it was, as I said, it was a very experimental time. I, I did a whole series of hand stamping paintings where I was sort of questioning what was more real, um, the hand or that which the hand leaves behind. This is Wave, this is Bob. Joseph. And so uh, it was about that time that I had my first big show in Baltimore and a really, really unique sort of thing happened. Um, a woman came up to me in the show and said, I love your paintings, Mr. Chapman. It's, it's like they've, um, your, your figures are, have, have been working all day and they've come home and sat down and, and slipped into this sort of astral flight and the, their souls are leaving their body. And I thought, wow, that's really beautiful. This is my sister, Kelly. And then about five minutes later, this kid comes up dressed in all leather and tattooed and pierced. And they did that in the 80s, too. And uh, he says, oh, Mr. Chapman, it's the detonation of the bomb. It's the last nanosecond before everything's obliterated. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and it, it occurred to me that night when I went home that um, that's exactly what I would want people to do, to see these sort of polar opposites that, you know, I've always felt that art is meant to be provocative and, and to, uh, that, that we bring our own baggage to the painting, like we come to the altar and we exchange this information and we leave uh, forever altered. Um, and that, that, that these polar opposites, uh, depending on their experiences, uh, led them to their very different interpretations. I knew I couldn't go right back to full color, so I started doing color paintings and then glazing my white light over it. And uh, here is actually a much larger version of that um, altar. And I started putting color right at the penum penumbra between the light and the dark of the figure, the shadows. This is arm with books. As I moved back to full color, I started, I, I, I continued to use encaustic with the paint just to kind of keep it a little clunky. This is arm with books. I often title my paintings to, to, to to further their provocation. So it's either arm with books being a literal still life or it's a command to arm oneself with books. So uh, it was in 1990, I came to UAB and it was at, after a year or two of being a professor, I had this amazing sort of confidence. It's that maybe I can go back to full color painting and be um, 
and let my the natural influences influence me directly. Uh, thinking of Caravaggio and the great altars. Um, so this is Mutra and Tokter, which is at the Montgomery Museum. This is Requiem. I did a whole series on anima. I think this is the only one I'm going to show you, but this is uh, anima and the electromotive forces, uh, magnetic hysteresis. I was very interested in Carl Jung and his notion of anima, which is the feminine soul inside of every male artist, or, or and the ani, anima, the feminine soul inside of every male, and the animas, the uh, masculine soul inside of every woman. It's torso with stick. This is Ein, Ein Andres Grabma, which means um, another artist, another tomb. Is at the Birmingham Museum of Art. It was about that time I started, I was doing these large altars and they took a long time and I was romantically thinking back to the charcoal drawings, which were very spontaneous. And I wondered if I could paint like that. And so I started the Anatomy of Reality series. They're all about 53 inches by 42 inches. This is a dialogue with David. And so I'd paint a ground and I would, I, I would let it sit in the studio and then I would paint an image and then I would start responding to it. And I'd want to create a narrative. Uh, sometimes I would have to add elements to, to destroy that narrative or to lead you in another direction. So it was a, a sort of a really liberating uh, series for me. However, towards the end of that movement, um, I started worrying about uh, the work being too heady or intellectual. And I didn't want people to think that they had to be able to do the mathematical equation to figure out what the painting meant, that I, I just wanted them to come to this experience and sort of pull all this together and sort of create their own narrative, even though I had a very distinct narrative uh, that I was dealing with. And um, so I started worrying that it might come across too heady, too intellectual, and I wanted to get back to the, the figure directly. Uh, this is uh, Probing the Wounds on the Right, which is at the Mobile Museum insight and seven dead seeds. I was using a lot of silver leaf and gold leaf at the time. And so uh, it was only natural that I was doing these large altars and I was doing this anatomy reality series that they would sort of begin to overlap. And this is Spike posing as Siddhartha. This is the anatomy de Geschlechter, which means the anatomy of man and woman. I did a whole series on Judas and this is the first kiss and the second kiss. This is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, it's actually the four horses of the apocalypse, and it's the four Greeks who were tortured by the gods for their offenses, Titius, Sisyphus, uh, Ixion, and Tantalus. They're quite large, uh, 36 feet, I believe, uh, across when, when they're um, hung on the wall. It was um, then, and getting sort of worried about this sort of over intellectual work, I wanted to get back to the figure and I wanted to see if I could paint a moment in time. Uh, and I started thinking about someone like Mondrian who made this huge departure when he started painting his abstract paintings. This is actually a Mondrian painting in the background. And I'm sort of placing myself in his situation and trying to imagine that moment of an epiphany. Uh, and out of that work came uh, Man with Stick, which is um, part of the collection of the Wiregrass Museum. And there's a tandem piece, uh, Woman with Stick. This is Mother and Daughter. That's actually my wife, Bernadette, and my daughter, Sadie. You'll see lots of Sadie paintings throughout this presentation. So I was thinking about a, mo a single moment in time, and, and I wanted to create this sort of provocative moment where you were questioning whether these people were ridiculing or making fun of this person. Uh, was, was this person um, reacting to all this energy or were they oblivious to it? Were they somewhere else uh, emotionally or intellectually? So I, I, I did about seven of those large paintings with five figures and I decided to reduce it down to the single figure that that was really the power for me. I was on sabbatical and I did a, a, a um, a residency at the U-Cross Ranch out in Wyoming, and I did 22 of these charcoal and ink drawings. I'm just going to show you those eight. Uh, and there are nine oil paintings from that series. Uh, this one is at the Meridian Museum of Art. And so I, I refer to these as my incident paintings, and they're just incident three, incident four, incident six. And I wanted to suggest, like, well, what does that mean, this incident? Um, it, is it, is it, um, are these figures in the moment of some sort of religious epiphany? Or is it something silly, like they stubbed their toe? Are they off into some astral flight? Is it erotic? Is it the moment of climax? 
but that somehow they were experiencing something emotionally very separate from us and we're very voyeuristic and and sort of examining them and looking at them at this pivotal moment this is on brass and gold leaf mary and Eve for Mary, man with sledgehammer. It was about that time I started, started the uh, Borrowed Body Part series um, and uh, my paintings of children. There were two different series that I would show together, which gave us this very stark contrast. And um, I wanted you to question um, what it means that this woman has, has taken on the arm of probably a man. This is a woman with right arm, which again is sort of, is it just the right arm or does it mean the correct arm? And this is girl with stick. My, my figures, um, especially in this series, um, are, are in that sort of proverbial search for meaning and truth. Um, this is a girl with stick at the Jewel Collins um, Smith Museum. This is my daughter, Sadie. And, you know, th that idea that um, children come to this search for meaning uh, with no baggage and the belief that they could catch a fish with just a stick and a string. Uh, this is a detail of that painting. There's my statement. Uh, it's on my website. You can uh, read it if you'd like, but uh, the adults in this search come with all kinds of baggage um, that uh, they're encumbered with um, because of growing up and experiencing peer pressure and whatnot. This is man with black eyes. So I wanted, I wanted to I wanted these figures to, in this proverbial search for meaning and truth, this, this man is attempting to see through the eyes of a black man. And, um, but ultimately I wanted you to question, is this just the prosthetic? Is it really flesh? And, and if so, what, what, what had to happen in order to benefit this man to have the ability to see through the eyes of another man, and then ultimately to recognize the absurdity of that attempt? as well-meaning as it is. This is the affirmation. This is Sadie. This is man with new voice, uh, questioning what does it mean that an African-American man may feel the pressure to speak more white in, in certain situations. And this is boy in a truck. Ambush at Tenderfoot Acres. It's Sadie again. <laughs> this is woman with new voice. Uh, questioning what does it mean that a woman may feel the need to speak uh, with a more authoritative, more masculine voice in order to be um, respected and heard, especially in, in sort of business culture. And um, what does that say about society? What does it say about her? And what does it say about us? This is man, <clears throat> excuse me, this is man with black eye listening. It's part of the Mobile Museum of Fine Arts Collection attempting to see through the eyes of a black man and to hear what a black man might hear. Man with new voice listening. This is Salamandrina, um, an Einstein's in a Neubauden song. Um, this is Sadie. And uh, after this painting, every painting that has a Sadie in it also has a salamander, which is the most complex living um, thing that can regenerate its own organs. It's also an ancient Christian symbol for a bravery despite affliction. And scientists are looking very closely at the salamander for this very reason that it can regenerate its own organs with the belief that this would be the ideal situation for um, organ transplantation. This is a woman with new voice. The swimmer, Sadie. <laughs> This is woman with right arm. Some of these are quite large and with the larger pieces, I would often uh, block away some of the paint. Uh, you can see at her breast there. And I, I just wanted to remind the viewer sort of a la Magri that this is, this is not a pipe. Um, this is not real, that this is a metaphor. And so what is the metaphor that this woman has taken on the right arm of a man or a white arm of a man? This is Sadie posing as Electra. Man with one wing. Again, that sort of search for meaning and truth, and then the futility of, of recognizing that, you know, the absurdity of flying with one wing. And this is a self portrait. This is Dada. 
which is a tribute to Sadie. Um, it's a message, a secret message to her. And there is a uh, scissors, arrow, uh, a dove, Ivy, and the tattoo Elijah, which spells her name, Sadie, S-A-D-I-E. Dada, in this case, either means um, like the Dada movement, that these are just happenstance things, that there is no meaning embedded in it, or it might be read as Dada, uh, the first word that a child might speak. And it's just a message to Sadie to arm herself and prepare herself for life. This, I don't do very many commissions, but um, there's a, a, a prominent collector here in town who loved my work and really wanted to see what I could do with his two girls and was completely open to whatever I wanted to do. And uh, so I created Endeavor and Persevere. This is um, X plus Y equals Z. Uh, convert, a converse, conversation I'm having with Sadie about logic <laughs> and flyboy. I was a gymnast and a diver. I've always been fascinated with flight and uh, just wanted to have a do a fun painting with a, a boy who might also be infatuated with the, the idea of flight. This is Sarah uh, Alamuka, and this is Girl with Puffin. I had been to the Ringling Museum and saw lots of fun circus posters. And that's where this um, three-year-old wunderkind uh, came from. This is Dog Sees God. That's my former dog, Pickles. This is a commission I did for the Alabama Power uh, Corporation. The helmet project was something I did a few years back in, uh, in thinking about 9-11, 10 years later. And um, it is 12 paintings of uh, people that have donned these custom-made helmets to block their vision. There are 12 of them. This is my artist statement at 8 a.m. on September 11th, 2001. It was easy to perceive our lives as serene. We were safe. Even while Bernie Madoff's crimes were being exposed, most saw our economy, our country as prosperous. We led the world. And while the scientific community embraces a vision of quantum mechanics and string theory shattering our basic understanding of the observable universe, we are left behind only capable of viewing Newton's world. We are blind. We are a visually biased society living in a time which we can no longer believe in what we see. With the advent of digital media, um, fake news, and whatnot, uh, these people have, um, have gotten frustrated and are looking inward instead of outward anymore, no longer believing in what they see. Uh, I took the paintings all around Alabama, photographing them in interesting places, collaborating with uh, uh, well-known photographers, and uh, I wanted to install them in interesting, beautiful, and macabre spaces um, because to me they're sentinels. Um, they're, they're sending a message out um, about this situation they found themselves in. This is a church in Montgomery, parking garage. I kind of fly through these. That's the downtown Y. It's an abandoned building in Birmingham. It's the flight museum, corporate lobby. Another church in Montgomery. I uh, did a show with the um, Huntsville Museum, Peter Baldaya, uh, paired me up with Carolyn Shear and we did a show about coming of age. And I did these three paintings and specifically with that theme in mind. This is Jim Rat. This is Bunhead. And this is um, Grease Monkey. My daughter was born with a very serious heart condition. She had open heart surgery at uh, nine months old and then open heart surgery again at eight. And then um, as she was going off to college in New York, uh, after one semester, her heart began to fail and she came back to Birmingham and had a heart transplant. I, um, it took a year and um, in the, in the, in the process of that, um, I sort of fell into a deep depression for quite a while and, and had a hard time making work. While we were in the hospital uh, waiting for Sadie's heart, I started this series of drawings I call the cathartic heart drawings. And we had heart patients uh, contribute to them. So that's Sadie and there's Jacob and there's Michaela. All three were on the floor um, while we were there. Um, and Sadie waited 108 days before 
her new heart came. So these are the three drawings. And I got back to my studio. And as I said, I kind of fell into depression and I could not paint. I couldn't drag myself to the easel. So I decided to borrow a, a line from the materiality of paint artists. And I just poured 108 black paintings on glass panels. They represent the 108 days that um, I waited for Sadie's heart, um, feeling helpless that there was nothing I could do uh, for my daughter but wait and hope. And so I uh, later created these crates that I framed, the hunt, uh, the, I contained the 108 paintings. And when I finally got back to the easel, I did these two paintings, um, three, which is um, representative of my family, my wife and I and Sadie, and two, which is representing Sadie and the donor, uh, where two people become one. And here, this is the only time I've ever installed the 108 paintings out of the crates. Uh, this is at a, a gallery in Gadsden. Uh, and now I show the 108 paintings just simply in the crates. Um, but it was a beautiful little church and it was just a, a really wonderful setting for the project. I, what I consider my most um, important work, I think, is my conversation series. This is my studio and you can see the helmet project there on the left. And here are four of the conversation pieces. These are quite large pieces. They're all 84 inches tall. This is Life During Wartime, the first one. Every conversation painting uh, is 84 by 64 and starts with some sort of iconic image. And so the, the robot you see there is Hell from Fritz Lang's Metropolis. This is a conversation I'm having with Sadie about her heart condition and how um, it's okay to cry and, 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 and try to deal with it. But at some point you put your helmet on and stand up and, and begin moving forward. This is recreation or recreation, which is a conversation I'm having with an African-American man about the state of um, race and race relations. This is uh, to be with you, which is a conversation I'm having with Sadie about relationships and finding the right one to love. This is re-engage. And there's a small study I did there on the right. Um, it's about male sexuality and war. And here's a tandem piece of advice, which is Raquel Welsh from uh, 1 million BC. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is um, in re-engage. So each one starts with an ar archetypal image that I use as a springboard for the larger conversation. Uh, woe man or woman. Uh, which is um, the George Graham's uh, sculpture out in LA for the 1984 Olympics, the female torso. And on the right is father. And those artists uh, will recognize uh, Leah Kuhn, which is the sculpture. Uh, the snake is hand carved. And this is uh, the monsters, he and she. Um, it is a conversation about transplantation and um, donors and in, in the text, it says, in gyros imus noct et consuma mirigni, which is a palindrome. Um, and it basically says, at night we dance and are consumed by the fire. There, there's my dog, my new dog. <laughs> and that's the studio. Uh, give you a sense of scale of the conversation pieces. Uh, I do a lot of charcoal drawing and I do a lot of charcoal workshops, but I never really made work myself. And so about a couple of years ago, I started the series of construction pieces uh, where I'm just contrasting linear perspective and charcoal with the sort of natural biomorphic form up above with ink. Um, and I, I construct a drawing machine that helps me draw in three point perspective. I started doing some of these on aluminum, uh, the monsters are also on aluminum panel, and that allows me to etch back in so the white lines you're seeing are actually the reflection of the aluminum. And there's some little ones. Uh, I recently did a series called Le Retable de l'Amour Charnel, which is uh, the altars of carnal love. Uh, don't worry, Dana, I'm not going to open these. <laughs> they are very uh, explicit. Um, and if you care to go to my website, you can see them, you can open them up. And I just would uh, uh, ask that you read my artist statement to, to put them in context. It's very important because um, I don't do anything 
I don't mean any of my work to be shock art, but these are very explicit imagery and it, 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 it starts this conversation about sexuality and sex and, and how important it is for our children to be comfortable with talking about that. And there's one large one. And again, they all open and you can go to my website to see them. <laughs> uh, one of the most recent series, I did a, a, a residency again in Wyoming, this time at the Gentel Foundation. And I created um, the firmament, falling, floating and flying. There are six of these paintings right now. Uh, there are act actually six others in progress, but six completed. And once again, I've incorporated encaustic into the paint. And the newest series, I've just uh, completed eight paintings. There are four more coming. There will be 12 in the Noir series. They're smaller and they're on aluminum panels. Noir lilies and Noir lily. All of them have sort of painted art deco kind of art nouveau frame. And they're in a shadow, shadow box frame. There are all eight of them. So I want to tell you, uh, my lecture is pretty much over, uh, but I wanted to tell you about a trip I, I took to New York. Uh, right after grad school, I moved to Philadelphia and I became a member of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And they were doing a field trip by bus to New York to see the John Singer Sargent exhibition. It was a truly profound moment for me, not just my first time to New York uh, and, and to go to the museum and to see Sargent's work. But the most profound thing for me was seeing these two paintings paired together. Uh, it still affects me today, Dr. Posey and, the, uh, and of course, Madam X. It was just thrilling to see them hanging side by side. And I know that has impacted my work. And I'm gonna show you very quickly um, how at various stages in my career, I sort of tried to sort of duplicate that same experience, either with Adam and Eve, uh, with Requiem, with Grease Monkey and Bunhead, with Advice and Reengage, pairing a male and female panel, um, certainly the monsters, he and she. And I just wanna come back to um, Man with Stick, which is at the Wiregrass Museum. And it is my um, hope and desire that one day they'll hang together. Um, there is my website. And um, I would love to answer questions if there are any. Let me unshare my screen. Stop share. That's okay. That was incredible. Well, thank you, Holly. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna start uh, the Q&A now. If you want, um, there is a, an actual Q&A box for people to ask questions. Um, if you've already written them in the chat, I can go there as well, but there is a Q&A box. Um, before, while we're waiting on some of those to queue, I have, I have a question for you. So yeah. I just assume that you were like born naturally talented and you could just <laughs> draw from childhood. Is that right? No, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, well, I like to tell the story that, uh, I was always obsessive compulsive, but uh, back then I don't think we even knew what that meant. Um, uh, one sign of it was, uh, my second car, but I was still in high school, a 71 Mustang. I, I really got into it and uh, I would wax and clean it twice a week. <laughs> it never got dirty. It was just, it was my thing, you know, and it wasn't until I went to college and my junior year, I took a painting class and it just, it just clicked. I just knew that that's what I was going to do. Wow. Because yeah, this whole time I'm like, yeah, he had to have just been naturally talented. And then I just assumed you knew at a very young age. Okay. No. No. Interesting. All right. Well, okay. So we've got a couple of questions here. Cool. Um, one question is what does Sadie think of herself in so, so many paintings? Uh, it's funny. You know, I remember <laughs> I actually did a lecture at the Wiregrass Museum many years ago. Sadie was little. Um, probably seven or eight. And um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but, but she, 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 made, <laughs> she made sure that she sat very close to me so that everybody knew that she was affiliated with me. I think she's, I think she's really proud of me. Uh, she would never tell me that. Um, and I think she really loves being in the work, but she would never tell me that. And um, but she's very humble about it. She's, yeah, it's just, it's just what daddy does, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and then uh, someone else says outstanding, not really a question, but just so you know. Um, and then we have a question, uh, where do you find your models? Oh, uh, um, other than Sadie. <laughs> yeah. um, well, the Helmet Project, uh, the, our students, uh, are there any, there's a family member in there. Um, I, I occasionally see people and just say, oh my gosh. In fact, you asked about this painting right here. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Sarah Alamuka. Uh, I saw her and I just knew I wanted to paint her. So, and at the time she was very young. So I, I went to her parents and I said, um, I know you don't know me, but I want to paint your daughter. <laughs> I saw a guy in the gym once that uh, I, he was just, I just knew I had to paint him. He's in uh, recreation. So uh, I'm not, I'm not hesitant to ask people if, if I just see a look that I, Mutter and Tochter was a German professor at UAB. And I saw her walking across the street one day and it was just like, oh my gosh, I'm painting her. <laughs> so they're family, friends, uh, students. And then colleagues, like I know Woman with a Stick is... Yes, Another, well, a fellow artist. A fellow artist, yeah, Karen Graffio. Um, okay, next question is, do you complete an entire series before beginning a new theme? And in the conceptual stage of a series, do you know how many pieces will be created? It's a good question. It is. Uh, uh, like Anatomy of Reality, which I don't even know how many are in that series, probably 30. I think I showed about 10 of them. Um, I worked on that series for three or four years and it, you know, I, I never had really an end date until all of a sudden I said, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm gonna get back to straightforward figurative painting. But, but then series like the Helmet Project, I knew there would be 12 and um, it, which is sort of easy, you know, kind of like the Christian idea, the disciples, and it just seemed like the right number. Um, and consequently there are 12 in the Noir series. Um, but then I'm, I, I'm about to finish the last four in the Noir series. And that probably will be it, but you know, I don't, I don't hold myself to that. I mean, next year, who knows, I could do a couple more. Um, sometimes you just know when it's over. So do you normally complete a series before you start working on another one or is it just kind of all happening to the same it, time? It can all happen. They, they certainly overlap. Uh, I've actually got two other series I'm working on right now that um, I mean, I'm continuing with the conversation series. I definitely plan to do more conversations, which are the really large ones. I've got two built and ready to go. Uh, and then I've started on a third series and I'm working on the noir. Uh, I hope to finish those in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, another question, do you, are, do the helmets actually exist? If so, where are they? You know, as several people have asked me that, and I love the idea of of, of making it, but they don't exist. I, they're just completely made up in my head. I I um, I designed probably thirty or forty helmets, and then I reduced it down. And the funnest part of that project was picking which helmet would go on which model. Um, but yeah, the helmets are just completely um, made up. Okay. Um, and then uh, in your search for meaning, is the child the key? Interesting. I do, you know, like I said, I like to, I, I love showing those two bodies of work together and how different um, we come to that search, the adults encumbered with all this baggage, this, this feeble attempt to look through the eyes of another or to take the arm of another. And the, the children were just are sort of naive, but they, you know, they really believe that they're, they're going to find what they're looking for. Um, uh, I think I think it's a combination of the two. I don't know that either one is the right answer. You know, I, 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 there's something about knowledge that you know the children don't have. It's important, but then it's also important not to be too pessimistic. So I, I don't know the 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 answer to that question, even though okay. it's a good question. <laughs> Um, so this next question is actually something that I was thinking. Um, so tell us about your early days in painting. It really threw me that you weren't just naturally, you know, hmm. creating at a really young age. So yeah, tell us how that all started. Well, I will tell you, I did do three paintings when I was in junior high. Uh, silly, silly story. Um, in nine, April 3rd, 1974, Xenia, Ohio uh, was hit by a very serious tornado. It was a... Um, it was a supercell that occurred all over Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, and Xenia was was uh, just leveled. And um, 
consequently, uh, our house was destroyed. And, and um, when we were finally moving back into our house, we went to this strange thing I'd never heard of. It was in Dayton. And it was this furniture warehouse. And there were all these fake rooms, living rooms, you know, and there was couches and, and there was matching art. And I looked at a couple of these graphic paintings. And, you know, they were just silly sort of 70s graphic <laughs> abstract paintings. And I was like, Mom, I could do that. <laughs> And she bought me a couple canvases and I actually painted like three paintings uh, and then just never touched it again um, all through high school. And yeah, it was in college, my junior year, I took the painting class and it just, um, yeah, it really hit me. I knew. So did you have a mentor that really helped you kind of guide that passion or? Uh, you know, uh, I, went to I went to Berea College, which was just a, an incredible experience, a small liberal arts college in Kentucky. Um, they were kind of behind, it was not only was it the late 70s or early 80s, but they were kind of like 20 years behind the time. And ironically, I was never really given a painting assignment. I was never really taught how to paint. They, they, they didn't want to stifle creativity. So they just said, paint and we'll talk about it. Um, so it was it's so ironic because I don't teach that way today. I teach a very specific beginning painting class about how to see, observe, translate. And I find that that really empowers people as opposed to uh, stifling creativity. Uh, but my experience at Berea was really uh, fabulous. And, uh, and I knew since I started so late, I, I had to go to grad school because I, I wasn't sure I could keep that momentum up. So immediately out of Berea, I went to Cranbrook and, um, and that too was a really excellent experience two very unique institutions. Um, okay, next question. I know you used to write grants for your projects. Do you still do that in order to afford your passion slash series? I would love to. I, I just, I've exhausted Alabama. I can't, I can't get any more <laughs> Alabama State Council grants. I might have to new, move to another state. Um, <laughs> and the SAF NEA grants, they no longer grant them. So uh, yeah, I'm always open to, to looking for grants. Uh, I've applied to a couple of the big ones, but um, they're, they're, they're way up there. Maybe okay. one day. <laughs> um, next question. What, what do you do in your downtime? Um, hmm. Paint. <laughs> um, what do I do in my downtime? I love movies. My wife's involved in movie making and we watch, watch a lot of movies. Um, yeah, I'm a pretty simple person. <laughs> the painting pretty much. <laughs> um, okay, next question is how is Sadie's health now? She is doing great. She uh, is 25, um, has, she lives in New Orleans now. Uh, she, she, uh, by the way, after she had her heart transplant, you know, she had to take a year off. She went back to New York and finished her degree at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. And like all actors, she's now a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next is, uh, how did you get noticed to start showing your art? You know, I, I, I told the story about uh, the, the two different people coming up to me in Baltimore, uh, the woman and the young kid, the punk kid. Uh, that was my first significant show. And uh, it's so funny. Um, I, had, I had this one piece in this silly little juried show. And it just so happens the curator from um, Baltimore's, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the gallery now. It'll come to me in a minute, but it was Baltimore's premier alternative space. And the woman had seen my painting and she calls me up and says, Mr. Gary, she goes, I, I saw your painting. I'd love to come uh, visit your studio and see what work you're having and maybe give you a show. And I'm like, Kelly, <laughs> that's my sister's name. Cause I just knew it was my sister calling me and, and, and uh, playing with me. And it turned out it really was this woman. Well, she came to my studio and I had tons of work cause I really was prolific in Baltimore. And uh, she gave me this one man show. I can't think of the name of the gallery right now. Um, and, uh, it was my first big show and I, I felt like I had made it. <laughs> what year was that again? Did you say? That would have, that would have been, uh, in the late eighties, it would have been like 88, 89. And then consequently a year later in 90, uh, I went and interviewed in New York and landed the job with UAB. So I came down in the, the fall of 1990. 
Okay. Um, in your painting class, this is a former student. I remember a certain personalized mantra that you had posted large on the wall. Can you remind me of this mantra if you remember? Well, there, I, I, hmm, I wonder what student that is. I see. I see. He, he said pre-millennium. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, there's two things. I have a mantra and I passed it out in my beginning painting class. And I don't think they're talking about that though. I did have a big sign in the painting studio and it said, I slash slash your name will not paint. And I rattled off all the cliches, Elvis, Raggedy Ann, Winding <laughs> Roads, Piano Board Keys and Mushroom Clouds and Starving Children in Africa. And I just, I just listed at, just over and over and over again, all these things not to paint. And, uh, and then I would say, or paint them all in one painting. <laughs> and I, I think they're probably talking about that. It no longer tell us that that's it. His name uh, is uh, David Matthews. Oh, David Matthew. All oh, awesome. Hey, David. And I see Nathan out there. I see Joseph out there. Um, I see Sam is out there. Awesome. And my sister must be there somewhere. She's always. <laughs> I'll look for a Kelly. Oh, yeah, there's a Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another question is how long have you been teaching at the at college level and does it continue to give you pleasure? 31 years and I do love it. I, I really do love teaching, although I have to admit I'm starting to romantically think about retirement. Uh, you saw a picture of my studio and, and uh, UAB gives me that studio and that that's one of the things that keeps me there because I just, I couldn't live without my studio. And, but I do really enjoy teaching. Um, I really do. I have some phenomenal students. If you're friends with me on Facebook, I often post my student work. Mostly I'm, I post beginning student work though. I'm a little hesitant about posting advanced student work because it's their work, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, but um, I, I post a lot about my beginning painting class because I have some phenomenal painters. And at the end of my website, if you scroll down my website, I have two links, uh, beginning students and advanced students. And you'll see some great advanced work there. Okay, yeah, I'll have to check that out. I don't think I saw yeah. that. Yep, that's a very um, And then um, I knew Gary at uh, college, how do you, it's Berea. How do uh -huh. you, Berea. Okay. Uh, everyone knew his work and was very special even then. <laughs> Is that, that must be Joseph or Nathan. It's Nathan. Um, and then, um, not your sister, I don't think. This is uh, Kelly Burwagger. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions. Um, and uh, yeah, David Matthew said it was about painting cliche. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then let's see if there's any. I'm just going to scan through the chat really fast and sure. see if there's any more questions. Um, I don't see any more in the chat. Um, well, I certainly want to thank everybody for coming, especially all those old friends and family. <laughs> and then you have, uh, this is not a question, but this is from someone. Congratulations, you are still amazing. It's been nice hearing your voice after so many years. Thank you for the series on transplantation. Uh, the waiting period is trying and nerve wracking. I waited for four years for my kidney. We all feel the connection to Frankenstein coupled with the incredible gratitude to our donors. Your work depicts the dynamic lives we lead following surgery and the terrible darkness of waiting, especially must, since we are waiting for a death to save our lives. That must be Peggy. Hey, uh, Peggy. Penelope. Maybe Peggy the point. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I, it, I, I, it, hmm, it, raising awareness about transplantation is just uh, incredibly important. Um, I hope everybody on their license has that little heart that uh, says you're an organ donor. Sadie, uh, we know, um, you know, the, the, it's interesting. They, they leave it to the, the donor family and the patient to decide whether to contact each other. And Sadie has chosen not to yet. Um, one day she hopes to contact the family. Um, but um, I, th I think she just needs a little time, but it's, it's, you know, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said things like, you know, how was that knowing that somebody had to die in order for Sadie to live? And I said, you know, I, I just say, you know, the fact is people die every day. People die every day. Thank God some of us 
um, choose to be donors and, and save other people. Sadie could have easily died on, on the hospital floor, never received a heart. But thank God for that man in Florida who um, thought of Sadie. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to look through here just one more time and see if there's anything else. Um, thanks so much, Gary, for being with us tonight. Um, it's been really incredible, you know, looking at the scope of your work and all of it together. Um, it's incredible. And I mean, I can tell that you've been doing it for a, a long time. Um, and I love to see the, you know, the ebb and flow and the evolution of, of where your work goes. Um, so thanks uh, again for being here. Um, we have a lot of people saying they've enjoyed hearing from you and thank you for your time and inspiration. Well, Holly, I hope you and Dana, uh, when all this COVID thing's over, I hope you'll invite me to the museum uh, to do one in person. Definitely, for sure. That would be wonderful. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, have a great evening and uh, we'll see you next time. Excellent. Thank you, Holly. Right. Oh, I should say next time really fast. I can't think of the date right now because it just, we just scheduled it, but uh, Pinky Bass, um, Carolyn Demerit, and Susan Walker will be our next artist talk. I think it's in May, but I need to double back and look, <laughs> but stay tuned because that's going to be one to really, to watch. So I know everyone have a great night. Yep. I know Pinky's work. Excellent. Yeah. So good. All right. Bye. Bye.